Hello there, this is Dr. Mintz. Uh, among my goals for this course, uh, I would like you to be able to feel comfortable navigating your way around a CT of the abdomen or, for that matter, an MRI of the abdomen, and also be familiar with ultrasound. So this is a coronal CT of the abdomen. We usually say it's abdomen and pelvis. Um, I don't really view the two as discrete separate compartments, but anatomically they are distinguished and certainly in terms of reimbursement, it's a big um, component of uh, deciding how much is going to be paid, whether you do just the abdomen, which is from the diaphragms down to the iliac crest, or whether you include the pelvis. But that's a, a political issue to some extent. So here we have a coronal image of this abdomen, and I'll let you kind of look over it, which is usually what I'll do in these kinds of discussions, just to be familiar with your, the various anatomy and to look it over on your own. And then I'll point out, well, this, this is certainly the liver here, isn't it? And uh, inferior medial too, the liver is where the, the, the uh, Porta hepatis is where the portal vein and hepatic artery and bile duct are. And a lot of the things that I will be speaking of are not intended to be your one and only time to hear them, so I won't necessarily go into a great deal of detail about everything that I mentioned, but through the course and through multiple videos that you review, things will be reinforced, reinforced just by virtue of repetition. So the axial images are usually more familiar, so I'm kind of throwing you a curveball here, but it's more comparable to a KUB, which is a frontal view of the abdomen and pelvis. So here's the liver, here's the spleen, here are the two kidneys. If you look near the kidneys, sort of superomedial, you usually will find the adrenal glands. So superomedial, here's one here that's kind of like an upside down Y. See how it's kind of Y shaped there? And the one on the left, also an upside down kind of Y. Both of them are farther from the native kidney or so a little bit farther from the native kidney than I usually would expect. But that's because the amount of retroperitoneal fat that is deposited uh, in various individuals is extremely variable. So when people lay down fat when they eat more than they should or, or have in the past and they put on fat, some people put it mostly on in the subcutaneous compartment, some put it in the abdominal compartment, compartment generally. Uh, and some people will particularly put a lot of fat in the retroperitoneum, which is where the kidneys lie. And I think that's probably why the adrenal glands are a little farther away from the north pole, if you will, of the kidneys. Okay, so here's the liver. Bowel is important to recognize, so here is the stomach. And you can see the rugal folds of the stomach fairly well. And here's the typical appearance of a stomach that you would see on an upper GI series, for example. And then if we follow the distal stomach into bowel, we know that we are first encountering the proximal duodenum, which is where we would see the duodenal bulb on a good upper GI series when it is distended with air and contrast. And then that's the first portion of the duodenum, and then the second portion of the duodenum courses downward like this, second portion, third portion, and fourth portion. And the transition from the fourth portion to the, the uh, ileum, I'm sorry, to the jejunum, is uh, at what they call the ligament of trites, and this is an important developmental feature, the ligament of trites. So here you can see once again, you see the uh, first portion of the duodenum 
right in here, kind of collapsed in this case. Then you have the second, the second, the third, and then the fourth, and then at the ligament of trites, it transitions to the jejunum. When you think of a ligament, you might think of it as an isolated, localized, focal structure. But in this case, the ligament of trites is really just a reflection of peritoneum, and there's a lot of peritoneal layers in the abdomen that are covering bowel and covering the lining of the abdominal cavity, and uh, that includes the greater sac and lesser sac, which you will learn about, I think. So this is just a reflection of peritoneum that comprises what is called the ligament of trites. So that is an important transition point because it's by definition where the duodenum ends and the small bowel, or rather the jejunum begins. The duodenum is actually part of the small bowel. So where the duodenum ends and the jejunum begins, and then the transition from jejunum to ileum is a little less discreet and not marked in such a clear manner as this. Okay, the C loop of the duodenum is sometimes referred to, and that is where the first portion of the duodenum is the upper part of the C, and then the second part is the mid part, and then the third part is the lower part of the C. So somewhere in here, perhaps you can kind of envision a C, a C shape, but we don't see the C, we don't see the uh, first portion of the duodenum well here, so we don't see the top of the C. But this is the C loop, and the C loop kind of envelops the pancreatic head. So here you can see some pancreas, pancreatic tissue right here, and that pancreatic tissue extends inferiorly and a little bit toward the right where it nestles itself into this C loop of the duodenum and that's where the pancreatic head is located. Okay. Uh, other things we can see on this study are mesenteric vessels and we will discuss the anatomy of these mesenteric vessels as they are they are vital anatomic structures, vital physiologically for the purposes that they serve, and anatomically for recognizing important problems that can develop secondary to, uh, for example, bowel ischemia. Okay. And right near the liver, maybe you've noticed, there's a structure here, and this is the gallbladder. And the gallbladder, in this case, has something very interesting going on in it. And that is, is that there are gallstones. Now, most gallstones are not calcified. These are vividly calcified. We have a, a uh, bullseye kind of appearance to, these, to, to this stone right here. That's one stone with a layered external layer of calcium and a central nidus of calcium. But that seems to be situated also right near some very small granular stones right here. So an interesting little pattern of gallstones, this type with a lamellated or layered appearance, and then the more typical granular, smaller stones layering a dependent aspect of the gallbladder. I don't see any obvious gallbladder wall thickening. Uh, getting back to the mesenteric vasculature, there's venous and arterial, and it'll be important for you to become familiar with the superior mesenteric artery and the celiac artery, as well as the inferior mesenteric artery, and also to be familiar with the portal vein. So suffice it to say that here we have on the leftward more aspect, we have mesenteric arterial branches going to the bowel, and here we have mesenteric venous branches coming back from the bowel to the mesenteric vein. We'll go over the details of 
mesenteric vein in another discussion and the mesenteric artery, but you can see both nicely portrayed here on this coronal image. And notice that the bowel is at the perimeter of the, the mesentery, the mesentery being this fatty tissue that has ve uh, blood vessels and lymphatic vessels and lymph nodes and fibrous tissue and a lot of fat. And it's on the edge of that sheet-like structure that bowel is distributed and thereby arterial supply and venous drainage can take place through this sheet-like structure providing the vital vascular supply to and from bowel back to the system and in, in this case the venous return goes entirely through the liver through the superior mesenteric vein into the portal vein and then through the liver through the portal system. This patient happens to have an IVC filter. You might have heard about them or you have seen them before, but that's what this is. This is an IVC filter and this is not a filter at all. This is the aorta with aortic calcifications. So this is an interesting portrayal of the similarity of appearance between aortic calcifications and inferior vena cava filter. This is just one of several types of vena cava filters. These are placed because the patient typically has had pulmonary emboli and pulmonary emboli almost universally are the result of blood clots in the legs. Uh, that's, the gen that's sort of the lay term, blood clots in the legs. We know that what we're really referring to are thrombi in the deep venous system of the legs. So when we have pulmonary emboli, it's almost always casts, in other words, worm-like structures, casts of the veins in the deep venous system of the legs that migrate up from the femoral vein and iliac vein through the iliac vein and through the SVC into the heart and then to the lungs. And this filter being placed in the IVC stops those, those uh, hopefully stops those clots or thrombi from migrating all the way up to the heart and causing uh, emboli to the lungs, which can be a life-threatening condition. Okay, so that's just a little overview of some of the anatomy we'll be going over in this course. And here's an ultrasound just to show you how nicely ultrasound can work in terms of demonstrating gallstones. So these are the same gallstones that we just saw on the CT. You can kind of make out the concentric appearance of the outer calcification and inner calcification in this case. And this is shadowing. This is a very important finding. So unlike a lot of these other images where you see things that are superficial to the gallbladder in the stones and deep to it, in the case of shadowing, this is an example of shadowing here, the echoes from a certain area of the stones is sufficiently in, uh, intense. The shadowing is, is very prominent and uh, causes an obscuration of visualization of anything deep to it. So this is very classic appearance of shadowing from stones and the three rules that we look for to identify that there are gallstones is that they are hyperechoic, they move, and they shadow. So that's the big three that we want to see and here's a good example of shadowing and that's because so much of the sound energy is reflected back by this interface of fluid and soft tissue with, with this calcified stone, or even if it's not calcified, it's usually sufficiently hard that it gives you a very bright reflection and there's results in shadowing because of loss, uh, loss of the sound energy, the ultrasound energy in that 
area deep to the gallstones. Okay, and on ultrasound we do Doppler studies also looking for patency of vessels and we always like to see the common bile duct and we always will measure a common bile duct anytime we do a, an ultrasound of the abdomen looking for stones in the duct <clears throat> or dilatation of the duct. So it's one thing to have stones in the gallbladder but if you have stones in the duct and or dilatation of the common bile duct or common hepatic duct uh, that will have significance in terms of what will be done with the patient and, and um, whether cholecystectomy might be performed or uh, some other type of intervention. Okay. Well, that's enough for now. I just wanted this to be kind of a little introductory discussion of mainly CT of the abdomen. And uh, I'll say that that's it for now. <laughs>